Well, thank you, and welcome back to the general session. You know, over the years, MSEC has really enjoyed the gracious contributions of a lot of outstanding partners. And we're really blessed to have sponsors that fund such things as student travel, lodging, meals, and even some of our giveaways. Well, one of those long-standing platinum partners has been BAE. And joining us today from BAE, BAE is Mr. Reggie Robinson, the Director of Government Relations for BAE Systems. And Reggie is also, I'm proud to add, as a retired airman, a retired colonel from the United States Air Force. Please help me welcome Reggie. And everyone. On behalf of all the employees at BAE Systems, I am very proud to be with you today and I want to thank everyone for coming out and coming together and giving this important topic the attention that it deserves. And we often and rightfully applaud and recognize the commitment and the dedication of our men and women who serve in uniform, who give to this country and serve our nation and protect our freedoms. And that attention is well deserved. But I think we also have to remain focused and never forget the daughters and sons, the husbands and wives that hold down the fort when moms and dads deploy, those who move from base to base wearing no uniform, yet providing a fundamental support structure to those who serve. And recognizing them is the reason that we're here today. Each of you, whether you're a teacher, a student, a parent, a military or education leader or a volunteer has done a lot to advance the fundamental rights of our military children to receive the education that they need and the opportunities that they deserve. And I would like to commend the Military Child Education Coalition for all the wonderful work that they do in support of military children. And we at BAE are a proud supporter and sponsor of this organization because of all the great work that they do. So with that, I am honored to be with you here today, and I'm honored to be a part of this fantastic organization. Thank you very much. Dance lessons wasn't something I passed when I was young. <laughs> Thank you to BAE for your continued support of MSEC and of our special national training seminar. It's my great pleasure at this time to introduce Lieutenant General Charles Lucky. General Lucky is the Chief of the Army Reserve and also the Commanding General of the United States Army Reserve Command. In that role, he commands over 200,000 soldiers and civilians with a footprint that literally covers all 50 states, five different territories, and 30 nations. You can say of the United States Army Reserve, like other services, that the sun never sets on the Army Reserve Command. And they're a critical force provider of trained units and individual soldiers, providing that, that full spectrum of combat capability that contributes to the joint team to help win our nation's wars, and also to respond to any homeland emergency that you and I might need. His force is ready at any time to meet the current challenges but also the future challenges that face our nation. And he continues to focus on unit readiness, soldier readiness, and families, because he understands that families are critical to soldier resiliency. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming General Charles Lucky with a warm MSEC welcome. All right, so I, got, I have a, the unenviable job of introducing my boss, and, and Holly Ann and, and, uh, and uh, Dr. Keller, which means I, I, I got to introduce people who need no introduction whatsoever. So uh, my boss told me, keep this real short and don't try to be funny. So that, 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 that creates all kinds of problems for me, but I'm gonna keep, I am going to keep this short. I do want to say a couple things real quick uh, before we turn it over to the, to the chief and Holly Ann. And, uh, and, and Dr. Keller and then the team of panelists who are going to grill the Chief of Staff of the Army here in a few minutes. Um, I want to start by thanking all of you for being here, for supporting us. Uh, Julie and I had the chance yesterday to come down here for several hours, uh, get, get uh, break bread with a few of you, and then 
sit through uh, different seminar sessions and learn more about what's going on and look at different capabilities and things that we're going to take back to America's Army Reserve. Uh, we were joined with, uh, with spouses and teammates from the, the, uh, the National Guard, the other services uh, across the entire joint force, and particularly for the reserve forces of the, of the United States of America. All of them are characterized by a couple of things that are common and unique, which is primarily all of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines live out there amongst the American people working every day in hometown America with children attending schools throughout the nation. And so in spite of the fact that just like the active component formations of the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, Marine Corps, uh, where soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines deploy into harm's way, and return, and deploy again, uh, many in, in some cases multiple times, uh, the reality is we got kids all over America out there in your schools, in your communities uh, that are supporting uh, their, their parents, uh, their teammates, and we're looking for everybody in this room uh, to help us make sure we're doing the best we can to, to honor these kids, to, to support them um, in, in education across America. I also want a special shout out to any, any military kids in this audience who are supporting their parents, who are taking care of the business of America uh, by serving in the armed forces and supporting your parents and doing that. I'll tell you just from the bottom of my heart how much we appreciate that support. We cannot do what we do without the support of our families, and in the case of the Reserve Forces, uh, the support of employers across America who are continuing to be a part of this team, uh, of the fabric, if you will, that supports uh, the, the national security of the United States of America. So thank you, all of you, for that. Two real quick thoughts, and then I'm going to get to my job, which is to introduce, as I said, Holly Ann and the Chief. The first one is, uh, earlier this morning, at a ceremony in the Pentagon, uh, we, rec we recognized uh, the latest entrant into the Hall of Heroes in the Pentagon, uh, Specialist 5 James Cullen, who was a, who was a medic in Vietnam, uh, the Chief of Staff, the, the Secretary of Defense, the Acting Secretary of the Army, and the Sergeant Major of the Army all, all recognized Doc, um, and uh, we had a fantastic ceremony. The, one, the thing I want to share with you, in addition to the story of heroism, courage, uh, intrepid, relentless commitment to the team, gallantry under fire for a span of about 48 to 72 hours at a, at a, at a battlefield in Vietnam. The, the, the takeaway, the teaching point for everybody in that room, and, and, and the, the Pentagon Auditorium was packed, was character with a foundation in family, in education, teachers and coaches across America and as, and as Doc said, uh, it was that, James Lewin said, it was that foundational experience in his life uh, that found him on that battlefield that day as a medic uh, with, with, the, with the good fortune and the courage to, to take care of and save the lives of over a dozen of uh, his fellow soldiers in a very, very tough spot. So I would just commend you, as in fact, I was talking to Professor of Military Science uh, here a few minutes ago about the fact that you just don't know the contributions you're making every day in developing character at the foundational level. Parents, teachers, and coaches uh, sending us all out there uh, with that in our, in our background. So that's that is just a point I would I would have all of us reflect on. Uh, I went to a little school in New Hampshire, and, a, and the school motto was "Finis origine pendent." That's Latin for the end hinges upon the beginning. And I would just say, from an educational perspective. Uh, I think that's true in spades, and everybody here plays a role in making sure that we're, we're good to that. Uh, other point I'd make very briefly, uh, 2012, if you haven't read it, I'd encourage everybody in this room to take a look at a Council on Foreign Relations report. It was a study done uh, by Condoleezza Rice and Joel Klein, who was the president of the school system in New York City at the time, about this nexus between national security and education, early education in, in the lives of every student in America. It is a compelling fact-laden document. It's about 100 pages long. I'd encourage anybody who's interested in education in America and the strategic imperative of education in America to take a look at that. You can Google it. As I said, 2012 Council on Foreign Relations, and it's about national security and the linkage to education. Uh, I think it's absolutely foundational reading for anybody who's concerned about where we're going in education in America and, and the potential prospects of what the nation looks like if we don't continue to pound away and making sure our, our kids are all getting the education that they need and deserve. All right, so without further ado, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna try to do the best I can to introduce two people that don't need any introduction by telling you a couple things about them that maybe uh, you don't know. 
So right now, my boss is back there going, Lucky, you better make this good, and you better make it short. So Holly Ann first. So Holly Ann and, uh, and the chief, uh, they, they, they've been married for 30 years. They've got two wonderful kids. Uh, Mary Margaret, who went to Holy Cross and is now uh, going to the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Uh, if you're Tar Hill, that's okay. I'm, I'm a Wahoo, but a tar, tar Hills are okay. I'm married to a Tar Hill. And then uh, Peter, who uh, went to Georgetown and is now uh, on his way, I think, to Texas to, to continue his education down there after, uh, after working for a while in between. Raised two wonderful kids, uh, married about 30 years. Uh, Holly, I knew that they met it in, in, at Key West. Holly told me that they met in church, so I'm going to go with that. Uh, <laughs> she's been a, a, a clinical care, critical care, cardiac care nurse for pretty much all of their married life. She continues to practice um, her skills um, as, as a nurse. And, <laughs> and, and so, so just, just to show you... What gallantry, what gallantry under fire looks like, I'm going to move on to the chief. So the chief, what you don't know is, chief went to Belmont Hill. He's from Boston. He'll tell you it's the Holy Land. He'll tell you it's the Holy Land, and that's true. He went to Belmont Hill. He's, he's a hockey player. So to, for a Princeton rat, for a Princeton... Hey, dude, for, dude, 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 dude. Four, three. All right. King, Kingman Brewster, president of Yale University, went to Belmont Cease Hill. Cease fire. Target down. You're done. Thank you, Chip. Thank you. Only nice, nice, nice. Who's an Ivy League graduate. Yes, cool. yes. I'm out of here. Who was the first cool. one? Uh, Leonard Wood. Leonard Wood, cool. very good. Cool. All right, get out of here. <laughs> All right, how's everybody doing? So, we introduced Holly Ann. Chip did. Thank you, Chip, for those remarks. Those are really lovely. And uh, I want to welcome everybody here. We've got uh, a few students that want to come out on stage. Come on out, guys. And they're going to pepper us with questions. <laughs> Mary, it's good to see you again. Good to see you too, sir. I want easy questions. Good Nothing job. hard. <laughs> go ahead and sit down. I've got to get my iPhone out because I have to go to Siri for any hard questions. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. Well, sir, uh, I thought you might want uh, you and Holly Ann to uh, uh, thank you all so much for being here and thought you all might want to just have a few words first before we start your grilling from our, our uh, Meet the Press panel. Meet the here. Press, the McLaughlin yeah. round. Uh, let, me, let me start off just real quick and uh, I think folks uh, there may have, may not have been a bio put out there, but I've been in the Army 37 years, and I'm an ROTC graduate, and, uh, and, and Holly and I have been married, as Chip said, uh, for three decades, and, and have uh, raised two wonderful children. Um, and for me, uh, and I think it's probably true of any normal human being uh, who is a parent, the most important person uh, or persons in their life is their children. And when it comes to being the Chief of Staff of the Army and uh, why is it important that I'm here uh, this afternoon, why is it important that uh, you know, we spend a fair amount of time talking about taking care of soldiers and families? A part of it is because we're normal human beings and we have empathy and love for soldiers and their families, but it's more than that. It's all about readiness. Uh, it's all about the readiness of the force. And if you're a normal human being, which most of our soldiers are, uh, they care most about their children, uh, and you will perform better in combat. Uh, you will perform better in training. You'll perform better at your job uh, if you know that your family, specifically your children, have a good school to go to, have good health care, have a decent house, uh, and so on and so forth, and a safe place to uh, work and play on an installation. If you think that they don't have those uh, capabilities there that are being taken care of with their families and your children, then your mind is not going to be on fighting the enemy or on training to fight the enemy. Your mind is going to be on what's happening to your children. Uh, so uh, how we take care of our children in the military is not only a, the right thing to do and a, and a humanitarian thing to do, that's for sure, uh, but it also is a very pragmatic and practical thing to do because it is directly related 
uh, to the readiness of the United States military, whether it's the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, it doesn't matter. Uh, taking care of our families, our soldiers, and our children uh, is a hugely important task to all of us in leadership positions. Uh, so thanks very much for the opportunity to be here, Mary. It's good to see you again. I appreciate everything that MSEC does and uh, has been doing for military families for uh, quite a long time. So, okay. Ms. Holly. Right. Well, thank you, Dr. Keller, for, mm -hmm. for inviting us today, and uh, we're, we're thrilled to be here. And I would like to first start uh, by praising our military kids are here. You're an amazing group of young people, and uh, we're so proud of you, and we know you are faced with a unique set of challenges every day, and you grow from these experiences, mm -hmm and you care for, for each other, and you embrace this unique and special life, which is military life. I'd like to thank the educators for taking this opportunity to learn about our military life and, and the life of our children. And you make such a huge difference when our children transition from school to school. Um, you make them comfortable, you play a big part in their success as they may move through several schools during their parents' military career. And you have a room full of very, very experienced young children here. And I encourage you during the course of the conference to sit down, talk with them, listen and, and hear about their military journey and um, what they love about the military and what some of their challenges are so you can take them back to your classroom. So we thank you all for coming and we look forward to your questions. Are you ready to saddle up? No. <laughs> Remember, I told you guys to ask about the Patriots, Brady, and the Super Bowl. That's the limit of my knowledge. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, we, we have um, prepared questions, and Elizabeth is going to start. And uh, uh, to let all of y'all know uh, who they are, we have a little summary of where each student is from. So still say your name in school and where in state. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Van Dyne. I came from Escambia High School located in Pensacola, Florida. And our first question is gonna be, what positive characteristics does someone of your status pose to complete your daily job? You asking me? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that there's, for the, for the job of Chief of Staff of the Army, um, and I would argue for any senior leader in any large complex organization is a multitude of character, characteristics and skills that you have to have. Uh, the Army is the third biggest organization in the world. The Department of Defense is the first. And the Army is a subsidiary of that. Uh, so it's a very, very large global organization. Right now we've got 180,000 soldiers in 140 countries. Uh, and you're spread out literally all over the globe. Uh, and we have, roughly speaking, about a million soldiers. Uh, there's more or less about 500,000 school-age children uh, in the Army. Uh, there's about 600,000 spouses. Uh, and you're looking at somewhere to the tune of uh, about seven or 800,000 uh, uh, veterans or, or a, uh, graduates of the United States Army experience who are now in the retirement uh, role. So uh, you're looking at a population for which we are responsible, for which I am responsible, and the Secretary of the Army is responsible. You're looking at an organization that's two and a half, maybe three million people. Uh, and about half a million are on active duty, about 300,000, 350,000 or so are in the Army National Guard, and about 200,000 or so are in the Army Reserve. So it's a diverse, complex, very large, very global organization. So how do you lead something like that? Um, first of all, you don't lead it by yourself. Uh, so teamwork is a critical uh, characteristic that you have to bring to the table as any senior leader, and again, I would argue that's true of any large complex organization. Uh, you've got to be able to operate in teams, uh, and you've got to be able to delegate responsibility and have a deep sense of trust in your subordinates' decision making, because there's no way that one human being is ever going to be able to personally lead an organization that large uh, if you constantly get into the details uh, on a global scale. There's just no way you can do it. So you have to have good, strict uh, change of command. Uh, a third thing I would think would, uh, uh, I would advocate for is high standards. Uh, the military, all the services have very explicit high standards. Uh, and you have to establish those standards uh, and then enforce them uh, globally. Uh, and then there's a set of uh, personal skills uh, that you have to have. One of them, I would argue, and I'd, I'd encourage all of you uh, and anyone listening, 
uh, is to read a lot uh, and to be open to different ideas, uh, innovative ideas, ideas that you may not have thought of. Uh, as a senior leader, you're not going to have the corner on the market. Uh, you're not going to necessarily know everything there is to know about everything. And you have to be open to a wide variety of ideas. Uh, and that can come to you from reading a lot. But it also can come to you from a variety of other sources. Uh, and the last thing I'd throw out there um, is character. Uh, so I talk to a wide uh, uh, array of officers, leaders, non-commissioned officers. And I would argue that competence skills, you know, technical and tactical skills, those are important. Uh, but the far more important thing, especially for senior leaders, uh, is character. Uh, and is, uh, that can be described in a lot of ways. Uh, integrity, transparency, honesty. Uh, but I think it's uh, uh, simpler than that in, in a way. Uh, I would default back to a couple of things. Uh, one is uh, treat others as you, wanna, as you wanna be treated, sort of the golden rule. And if you do that throughout life, I think that's not a bad rule, uh, and it builds into your character. Uh, the other one, uh, I think, is hubris. Uh, so hubris was an ancient crime, uh, or a crime in ancient Greece a long, long time ago. And hubris was the character trait that brought down the high and the mighty. Uh, and hubris was sort of a sense that uh, you're different than all the rest. Uh, you no longer put your shoes on the same way, and uh, you no longer the rules don't apply to you anymore, and that sort of thing. Uh, you start thinking you're above the, above the system, uh, that, you're, that you're, uh, you're better, you're conceited, you're arrogant, you're all hung up on yourself, you can't pass a mirror without looking at yourself. That, all of that is sort of hubris. Uh, and I think any senior leader uh, should guard against hubris. Uh, I think that's a really dangerous uh, disease, actually, for the rich, the famous, the powerful senior leaders of big organizations. Uh, and, and there's an easy way to get around that actually, uh, which is to carry around a little bottle, an anecdote to, to hubris, and it's called humility. And I think if we would all practice humility uh, on a routine basis, we'd be better off. Uh, and, and I think that we should all remember the old adage that uh, from dust I came and from unto dust I shall return. And if you start getting hung up about the stars and the uniforms and the badges and uh, start believing all the press clippings about yourself, you're going to run into trouble. Uh, so practice a deep sense of humility and, and avoid hubris. Uh, and have a good, strong sense of character, and that'll carry a long way in life. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Sir Will, he's, uh, Will's got a question for you. He'd like to follow on. Okay, my name is Will Fernandez, and I'm from Whispering Pines, North Carolina. I go to Union Pines High School. And uh, my question is, who has had the largest impact on you as a leader? For me again? Tom Brady? <laughs> no. That would be wrong. Hey, 39 years old, coming back 28-3, that's a big deal, right? So um, who's had the biggest impact? Well, um, it's ver it varies throughout your life, and, and there's uh, a lot of people. It's not just a singular person. Clearly, in my case, and probably in many cases, I'd say parents, my mother and father, uh, and I don't think any of us uh, would be anywhere uh, our personalities wouldn't be formed, our successes or failures in life uh, wouldn't have happened uh, without, uh, the, the, uh, without your parents. Uh, your parents influence you in ways that are just unbelievable. Uh, and, and I think that uh, in my case, both my mother and father served in World War II. My father was a, a Marine and landed at uh, Kawajalin and Saipan, Tinian and Iwo Jima and uh, and uh, my mother served in the Navy during World War II. And I grew up in a neighborhood uh, of folks that were uh, very patriotic. They all fought in World War II. And, and there was a certain set of values and character traits of, of hard work, diligence, honesty, and so on uh, that was sort of uh, uh, injected into you by osmosis, I suppose, either by your parents or by the neighborhood. Another group, and it's a group really of, of coaches, I played a lot of sports uh, growing up and through high school and college. Uh, coaches have a tremendous impact uh, on the development of young people, not only on their skills, but on their character. Uh, school teachers and educators uh, were a tremendous impact on me personally, uh, both in grade school and high school and, and again, on, on into university level. Uh, so those three groups of people were significant. Uh, then I would argue that in the military, I've had a series of uh, bosses, uh, some of whom, in fact, are here tonight, 
uh, that have had an extraordinarily powerful and positive impact on me throughout, the, uh, throughout my time in the military. Uh, and uh, in my case, as a commissioned officer, non-commissioned officer, sergeants had a huge impact on me, and there's been many of them over the years. Uh, so I couldn't single out a single person other than perhaps my mother and father who have had the most impact on me, uh, but I would argue that there's been a stream of them. Uh, then I would, all, all, lastly, I would argue that uh, both my kids and my wife have had a huge impact on me, and they have shaped me at more senior levels now, uh, but they continually keep me grounded. They remind me, you know, from under dust you came and under dust you shall return sort of thing. Uh, they, they, they remind me of that quite often. So uh, there's a whole series of people. None of us grow up in isolation. A human being is a social animal, and it requires literally a, a village to raise us sort of thing. And I always say it requires a village to raise a general. Uh, so lots of different people. Uh, and the key, I think, for you or anyone else is to be open to that. Uh, to be open to the help, the mentoring. No one gets anywhere in life by themselves. They get there because other people have helped them get there, uh, and then they have stepped up to the plate and performed when the moment came. Uh, but uh, we all require help to get anywhere in life, and there's no shame in that. You know, and, and then when it's your turn, you should always reach out and try to help others as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Would you ask your question of Mrs. Nelly, please? Yes. <laughs> I give you humans a little break. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Max Reidenauer. I'm from Warrensburg, Missouri, Warrensburg High School. Uh, this is for Miss Millie. Uh, what makes a military, military child unique? Okay. Well, I think all children are special and unique, but I do think we ask an awful lot of our military children uh, at a very young age with uh, multiple moves in the U.S., several moves overseas, um, separations from your soldier, your parent, uh, for training and for deployments. And, um, you know, when we talk to our children about this event, I ask them, what skills did you learn growing up in the military that you carry on through your adult life? And uh, they both agreed that number one was interpersonal skills. And military kids learn interpersonal skills at a very young age. And uh, I have just a little story. Every, we have two children, uh, a son and a daughter. Our daughter is the oldest. And uh, every time we would move and pull onto an installation, she would jump out of the car with her little brother in tow and run around the neighborhood, introduce herself and her brother, and say, the Millie kids are here. <laughs> and I think... <laughs> Military kids know um, <laughs> that they have to take the initiative as the new kid to get out there and introduce themselves. So interpersonal skills is one. The other is uh, resiliency, flexibility, and coping skills. I think a lot of our kids, all they've known, our young kids, is sometimes one deployment after another, and those are tough. And our kids are very resilient. Um, I think they tend to be more self-sufficient because they have to be self-sufficient. They have tremendous coping skills to deal with almost anything that comes their way. Um, they're also very adaptable. They're tolerant. They're very accepting. Um, we have moved several times and uh, lived in Korea, and our, our kids both said being exposed to different cultures, different experiences, and different people have, have broadened their, their life skills. So. I think throughout your life you learn these life skills and you're going to find yourself in new situations all the time as a kid and as an adult and some of them may not be so comfortable but all of the skills you have learned growing up you are going to be able to navigate your through, yourself through almost any situation that, that you come across in your life. So I, I think for military kids what makes them unique is the unique skills that they learn at a very young age that they carry through into adulthood. So uh, I, I want to just add something. So those skills that Holly Ann just talked about, uh, those have wide applicability uh, in the commercial sector, in the government sector, in sports, in the military, where you go into medicine journalism. It doesn't matter what walk of life you go in. And uh, I was struck 
uh, when I was, I knew I was coming here and I asked my staff, I said, give me a little research here on military kids. And I was struck at uh, how unbelievably successful, actually, uh, children who grow up in the military uh, have been. 90% uh, of uh, kids in, in the military grow up with a post-secondary or post-high school uh, plan. 78% of them end up going on to college. Uh, I asked for you know, a quick list of, give me some famous names out there. So you got, uh, I don't even know some of these people, but maybe you guys do. Uh, Khalid Robinson, a singer and songwriter, uh, supposedly the Rolling Stones breakout artist of the year. Uh, grew up at Fort Stewart. I don't even know what Rolling Stones is. I heard it was a magazine or something like that. <laughs> so uh, Fort Stewart, Fort Campbell, grew up at uh, Fort Drum, Heidelberg, uh, and Bliss. Uh, Michael Strahan, 15 years with the New York Giants. Uh, of course, you got RG3 with the Redskins. You got Shaq O'Neal in the NBA and multitudes of other professional athletes. Uh, Julianne Moore, Academy Award and Best ba Actress from 2015, uh, born at Bragg, attended nine different schools. Uh, Rhonda Storms, who's a, a state... Uh, was a state senator from Florida. Uh, John Cornyn, uh, the U.S. senator uh, from Texas, who grew up in the Air Force. Uh, Mir Ham, who was the uh, uh, soccer, famous soccer player, as you all know. Uh, uh, Johnny Damon, if you don't know him, you got to know him. He played for the Red Sox. So I don't know if you figured out, you know, the Red Sox are where to go. But then he, uh, then he uh, actually went to the dark side and played for the Yankees. Uh, Stan McChrystal, there's a, there's, a, there's a ton of people out there uh, in all walks of life who grew up in the military. And they tend to be quite successful, actually. Uh, and I think that's great. Uh, there is a, there's an um, element, growing up in the military for a military child uh, is uh, difficult, challenging, and stressful, as, as Holly just said. And what that teaches you at a young age is adaptability, resilience, uh, and the ability to move from place to place and fit in and so on. Uh, there's a, just a whole series of skills that you learn as a military child uh, that you wouldn't get in other walks of life. And those skills prove to be extraordinarily useful uh, later in life uh, as you go into a professional life in the commercial or military or government uh, sectors. So uh, there's an awful lot of good about being a military child. Great. Uh, sir, you know, Faith said she loves to talk, so she gets the next question. <laughs> Hi, my name is Faith. I am from Randolph High School in San Antonio, Texas. Go Texas. Stop. Keep going. Okay, my question is, how is a diverse community created within a military setting? Say that again now. Sorry. How is a diverse community created within a military setting? Um, yeah, so, first of all, our nation is extraordinarily diverse. Um, and, you know, right on, the, right on the dollar bills and stuff like that, it says, E Pluribus Unum. So from the many come one. Uh, that, from the very beginning of the Republic, has been an extraordinary strength of the United States of America. Uh, we are not a country of a single ethno-linguistic grouping. Uh, we are a country of diverse peoples that have come to this country uh, from all kinds of other countries. Uh, and from that, we were woven into a fabric called a nation state, uh, built around a certain set of values and principles uh, where uh, other countries don't have that sort of similar thing. All armies reflect their nation. Uh, so the nation is fundamentally diverse. And what makes America so fundamentally unique uh, amongst the nations of the world uh, is that we have a document called the Constitution. Uh, and I swear an oath of allegiance to the Constitution. Chip Lucky swears an oath to the Constitution. And uh, the President of the United States, the Supreme Court, all the members of Congress, we all swear an oath uh, to the Constitution. And embedded within that document, that Constitution, is an idea, and it's a very powerful idea, uh, that has uh, destroyed other countries like Nazi Germany or Imperial Japan or fascist Italy. It's brought down the Soviet Union. It's it's an idea that other countries or other entities hate. ISIS hates this idea, for example. Al-Qaeda hates this idea. Uh, but it's an idea that gave birth to our nation two and a half centuries ago. And it's an idea that uh, has uh, given birth to many other nations ever since. And you ask yourself, what is that idea? Uh, and that idea is that you and I, uh, no matter uh, who we are, whether we're male or female or whether we're black or we're white or Asian or Indian or no matter the color of our skin. It doesn't matter whether you're Catholic or Protestant or 
a Jew or Muslim or you have no belief at all. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor or famous or, or common. It doesn't matter whether you're gay or straight. In this country, in these United States, uh, this is a country of diverse backgrounds and peoples. In these, this country, in these United States that, that I am dedicated to protect and if necessary give my life for, every single person is created free and equal. That's the central organizing principle of this country. And that has to do then with diversity. Uh, and our army reflects the country. And our army and Air Force and Navy and Marines all reflect that in that we are committed uh, to maintaining high standards and you will rise uh, to the level of your merit and you will rise based on the content of your character, not the color of your skin. That is the essence of what this country is all about. Uh, and that is why our Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines are so powerful is because every one of us takes an oath to that idea and we're committed to that very, very powerful idea. An idea that all men and all women, no matter who you are, or where you came from, everyone is created free and equal. Francis, would you, Francis, please ask your question for Mrs. Milley. Hi, my name is Francis Bautista Uggen. I am from Shoemaker High School in Inkling, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> so this is mostly towards Mrs. Milley. Why do you believe S2S is more valuable than the average new student welcome programs utilized in schools? Okay. Well, I think uh, any um, program that welcomes new students is, is a very valuable uh, program. Um, but I think S2S is unique because it blends the civilian student with the military student. And I think in, in the military, we all know how important our civilian partners are and how much they support our installations and our families. And what a better way to bring them together than to have military kids and civilian kids working together. Um, I think uh, we were talking about some of you were telling us how many times you moved. The average time, or uh, the average number of moves for military kids is between six and nine during their, their school years. And um, so you know, as kids, what it's like to be the new kid. You know what makes, your peers will know what makes you feel comfortable. They know why you might be anxious. And you know what it's like to be the new kid all the time. And I think working together um, to ease that transition is very helpful. And um, I do thank all of you for volunteering for Student to Student. It's a great organization. It's been very successful. Um, and I think as parents, we want to thank you who volunteer for student to, do, student to Student because we know it's stressful for our kids to move. And just to know that first day when your child goes to school, they're going to have someone to eat lunch with. They're going to have someone to walk them to their locker, to class. It makes a big difference. And for the educators, I would uh, encourage you to have the military parents to get them involved because they too all have a lot of experience move with all of these moves and all of the schools. And they bring best practices and things that they learn from other schools. And when they leave your school, they will share the great things about your school and spread the word to different military folks who are coming in into the area. So Student to Student is, is a great program and, and I'm glad it's been so successful. And, and from the kids we hear when we, we hear from when we travel, it's, um, they love it. And anything to ease the stress and the anxiety of a move and a new school I think is great. So thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Tiana, you have a question? Hello, my name is Tiana Long. Um, I go to Airline High School from Boulder City, Louisiana. <laughs> um, what is your plan to better help military families re-enter the civilian workforce after time in service? The, uh, let me pause on that for just a second. Uh, on the previous question, I don't know if, if anyone in the audience knows it, but the high school, uh, I saw it on a little uh, uh, cheat sheet here in front of me, is Robert Schumacher. High school. General Shoemaker was uh, commander of Forces Command. I passed away not too long ago. He's a genuine American hero, and uh, that's a wonderful school you're going to. I've been there uh, several different times, and, and he was a wonderful man and a great leader in his own right. So uh, thanks for representing him really well. Thank you. Uh, um, to get to your question, how, how do we, um, uh, you know, train or facilitate or help 
uh, not just uh, family members, but soldiers uh, when they exit the military. Uh, and there's a multitude of programs uh, that we have. Uh, it's very, very important uh, for me as a chief uh, that we produce people, soldiers, of not only high skills, but of good character. And then when they go out into the society, uh, back into uh, the civilian society, that they become very productive uh, citizens. And I would say 99, we have about a 99% success rate. There are a few soldiers who go out there and don't do things that we're particularly proud of, but that's a rarity. Uh, the vast, vast majority of soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines uh, go out into society and do extraordinarily well. And the same is true uh, of their families and family members. So we have a, a variety of programs. We put a lot of money into it. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a lot of uh, work with industry. Uh, we have several corporations, I won't name them by name right now, but several corporations that we work closely with uh, that provide skills training. We have job fairs all over the place. Uh, we have particular uh, transition courses on every single uh, base as soldiers and or family members can use. Uh, think they do things like resume, help resume writing, uh, uh, practice interviews, and then they link you up uh, with different companies and corporations uh, for job interviews. Uh, we have a program uh, that we started uh, a while ago called Soldier for Life, uh, and that, that's where we want to keep the soldier, uh, regardless how many years they spend in the military, whether they're a career soldier or they're in for a two or three or four year hitch. Uh, we want them and their family to feel like uh, they are part of uh, the United States Army for the rest of their life. Uh, the Marines have always been good at this. My father was a Marine in World War II, and once a Marine, always a Marine sort of thing, and you know, you can take the Marine out of the Marine Corps, but you can never take the Marine out of the Marine. So uh, that's sort of what we want to do also with soldiers, uh, and, and to a, uh, a, a great extent that is, that is happening. Uh, and Chip Lucky mentioned uh, the Congressional Medal of Honor ceremony that we both attended earlier today uh, in the Pentagon, and we had the privilege of meeting 10 or 11 members uh, of, uh, of Jim McLuhan's uh, company that he was with in Vietnam, all soldiers. Uh, and these guys were in their 70s, and, and they were clearly soldiers for life. Uh, and they were bonded. You couldn't imagine how tightly these guys were bonded after a very intense fire, firefight and battle that they were involved in. Uh, and we want that spirit, that sense of belonging to an organization greater than yourself, uh, to last a lifetime. Uh, so we have a lot of programs to work that, uh, very specific programs on transitioning, and then more general programs like Soldier for Life. But we work hard at it, uh, and uh, we really are committed to making sure that uh, both the soldier and their family, when the time comes for transitioning uh, into civilian life, that they do that, do that properly uh, with plenty of advance notice, and that we do it with uh, forethought and, and deliberate, uh, deliberate plan to to transition into an alternative chapter of their life. Thank you. <laughs> so, the kids know that you guys might ask them some questions. So they're prepared for Mrs. Milley or for General Milley to ask. I have a question for Will. <laughs> Will, Bill? who's your favorite football team? <laughs> New England Patriots. Oh! <laughs> that wasn't planted, I swear. Huh? Go Pats, brother. I have a question for two of the, the students who um, are involved in student to student and they're not military kids and um, I would just like you to share uh, why you got involved and, um, and what, you're, what you're enjoying about student to student. I'm Elizabeth from Escambia and I got involved with S2S when I moved last year to Escambia because I knew how it felt every day to sit in the cafeteria and wonder, hmm, who am I going to sit with today? Well, as soon as I heard about S2S at Escambia High School, it was a new program. And we didn't really do too much. We did a few small events at football games. We got involved with other students. And it just made me realize that you can make a difference, that you have that opportunity. And every chance that I get at school every day, I try to touch a new student, a new military student, because it just opened my eyes so much to make me realize that 
you do matter, that student matters, and to always attempt to make a difference, no matter how difficult your challenges are or theirs. Wow. Who's your favorite football team? Mac. Kansas City Chiefs. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. I've they, been they, they, are they even a team anymore? Are they a team anymore? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, my name is Max. I'm from Warrensburg, Missouri. Uh, if you don't know where that's at, it's about 40 minutes uh, southeast of Kansas City. Uh, we're right by Whiteman Air Force Base. Um, I have lived in Warrensburg all my life, so I'm kind of a rarity uh, for the program. Um, but it doesn't mean that I don't want to help people. Uh, ever since I was a little child, I've always been talkative, and I've always wanted to help people, uh, especially my peers. Uh, Living in Warrensburg, you always have new people coming in and everything. Uh, I've always seen my friends go, seen new friends come. Uh, and coming into high school, I heard about S2S. I wanted to get into it, uh, meet more people, and just try to help them ease into it. Uh, hopefully make a new friend. Hopefully uh, have them uh, make a new friend. And I mean, just recently, I'm now the president of uh, S2S uh, at our chapter, and uh, it's definitely changed my life, uh, everything, especially uh, this conference. Uh, it's done a lot. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> we've, got, we've got time for another question or whatever you, you all would like to. You could ask them. Well, let me pick. Let me, let, me, let me see. Uh, so, Faith. What's the greatest state in the union? All of them. Oh, no. oh, very good. <laughs> what happened I to no you hard say Texas. I thought no for sure questions. it was going to be Texas. All of them. That was a very good answer. Very good. You know, we should make you a general. <laughs> yeah. Very good at answering questions. Um, what, what has been for the, for the there's uh, two Air Force, two Army. Um, in here, so for, let's start with the two Air Force. Uh, what has been your biggest challenge, and there's a lot of folks out here uh, with the Air Force, uh, what has been your biggest challenge growing up in the military, from your perspective? Um, I think just constantly changing and having to adapt to different things all the time has been one of the hardest things. I don't, I'm not a huge fan of change, I'm, I don't dig it, it's not my brand, so. <laughs> So just having to constantly change and adapt and make new friends and start all over like every two years, it's not fun. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, I kind of agree with like with Faith, like just changing and, you know, just coming home one day and then having like my mother tell me that we're moving and then I'm going to have to leave my friends, make new friends and adapt. Adaptability is one thing that like I've learned to really like have to like understand. Um, it's been it's been really challenging, especially like from a really young age to now. But um, it's it's cool though. It's still a really great experience to meet new people and to travel places. So it's amazing. Okay, great. And how, how about Will and, and Francis? How about you guys from the Army perspective? What's been your biggest challenge? What was the question? <laughs> your biggest 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 challenge growing up in the military. Uh -oh. um, making new friends, like everybody else was saying. And it's for me, it's nervous too because I'm not really a talkative person. But since S to S again, it opened up, you know, an idea for me that I can do something mm -hmm. and connect to others that have been in my situation too. Sure. So. Well, I don't know. It's kind of easy for me. I just get do it. <laughs> <laughs> you do it. You deal with it. Yeah. You roll with it. Uh -huh. That's great. Well, the, uh, you know, every one of you, uh, and you represent, you know, five hundred thousand, half a million others. Uh, out there, and uh, you guys are uh, make us proud here of just talking to you, but also you're making uh, all 500,000 uh, children that are growing up in the military, in the Army, are extraordinarily proud of what you're doing. Uh, all of you deal with things that many, many other people don't have to deal with, uh, and you deal with it in an extraordinarily mature way, in a resilient way, and a way that uh, makes you stronger, not weaker, and makes you more productive than less productive. Uh, so thanks for who you are and uh, what you will soon become. Uh, so thank you.
Yes, yeah, students would like to give you, on behalf of MSEC, we have a graphic to share with you guys. And if, if you all would bear with us, we'd like to have a picture with uh, the students and with the Millies, please. Sure. Can we clap again for the right. panel? Thank you, guys. How about that? To all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Quick show of hands. How many uh, educators do we have out here? How many like teachers type? It's hard to teachers, educators, professors, principals. Well, that's great. Uh, I've said in in other venues many many times. There's a lot of ways to serve the United States of America. There's a lot of ways to serve our great nation. Uh, one of them, and I'm particularly partial to it, is uh, wearing the uniform of our nation, wearing the cloth of our nation. Uh, I've always thought of that as uh, a very noble calling. Uh, but the other ones that I hold, personally hold in extraordinary high regard is being a mother. I think, uh, you know, I, I went on Siri a few minutes ago and I discovered that every one of us had a mother at one point in time. Uh, so uh, that's an unbelievably important job in America. Perhaps the most important job is being a mom. Uh, and I would throw out police officers and, 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 and fire, working in the fire department or the law enforcement or or public safety type jobs, those are really critical. Uh, but one of the ones that is often not mentioned very often, uh, but it needs to be, and, and more, more emphasis needs to be placed on it, is how important teachers are uh, to our country. Uh, and that is a way to serve. Uh, so thank you. Thank, thanks to all of you who are educating our children, uh, not only our military children, but our children uh, writ large in this country. It's a critically important job. And it really is fundamentally critical uh, to the national security of the United States. I'm not just saying that uh, just because I want you to get people to be more educated. Uh, the, the future of our country depends on a lot of things. One of them is the military, one of them is a strong economy, and one of them is on an educated, informed population. And that is what teachers do, is they educate and inform. So thanks for what you're doing. I appreciate it. Happens now. Ladies and gentlemen, as we transition to our next speaker, we'd like to share with you a video from BAE, a sponsor of this general session and our signature conference sponsor. There's a source of wonder inside us all. It's what causes us to take things apart. And it's why we're always looking for new ways to make things better. It's more than instinct that lifts us higher to peer over the horizon. It's inspiration that calls us to explore, to push beyond the limits. Throughout our life, this inspiration is with us, always growing stronger. Because at BAE Systems, our work is inspired by the wonder inside that's always been with us. The curiosity and commitment that give us the edge we need to see over the horizon, no matter what stands in the way. To look beneath the surface, no matter what may await. To continually push the limits to see how far it takes us. We know where the edge is. 
It's inside us, propelling us, guiding us, and leading us to a place where we're part of something bigger, where we have the opportunity to take things apart and realize what we are truly made of together, where we can be inspired every day to make things better, smaller, faster, stronger, smarter, and safer than ever before, where we can look inside, glimpse the future, and protect what's truly important, because we have the edge inside us. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage MSEC board member, Brigadier General Retired, Earl Sims. Well, those lights are bright. Uh, that was one, uh, one magnificent uh, show here, display of our folks, our young folks, and uh, I have to agree with the chief. Uh, that is our future, uh, no doubt about it. So uh, when we look at the news in the evening, don't worry about it. They're going to take care of us. Certainly. Uh, it is indeed my pleasure to introduce uh, the next uh, guest, uh, another long-standing partner and sponsor. Uh, Bruce Shabazz is the Senior Director for Strategic Military Initiatives uh, for the College Bound, or for the College Board. Put my glasses on. <laughs> A mission-driven but not-for-profit organization that connects students to colleges, success, an opportunity. Let's give a warm welcome to Bruce Sabas. I'm going to steal my opening uh, from General Shinseki. My name is Bruce, and I'm a soldier. Uh, more specifically, I'm an Army medic. Uh, and as was just mentioned, uh, I work at the College Board as uh, their military initiatives guy. Uh, last year, David Coleman was here speaking to the group, uh, and he talked about his, the partnership uh, with MSEC and his commitment to military families. Uh, this spring, he furthered that commitment by creating a position of military initiatives uh, and then hiring me, uh, in part because of my military cultural competence. Now, Terry Line right now just choked on her water because uh, me and competent aren't usually two things that are said in the same sentence together. Um, but I enlisted in the Army in uh, 1983. I retired in 2006. Uh, I served in Egypt and Germany at Fort Hood twice, Fort Campbell, uh, Fort Irwin, California. Um, so have a little bit of background and understand that. Uh, spent more years than I care to count working the Pentagon, uh, both in Army staff and working for the Secretary of Defense staff, so I know my way around the building uh, to try and help uh, explain what the College Board is doing. Uh, since joining the College Board, I've come to appreciate uh, the Khan Academy and the work that our partnership has developed. Um, you know, here in D.C., lobbyists make a lot of money, uh, and the reason is because people want insider knowledge. They want help to understand how a complex system works. Um, our headquarters is up in New York City and uh, Wall Street has a lot of stockbrokers who work up there who make a lot of money and we pay them to provide us that insider information, that expertise to help us navigate an inherently complex system. Well, the College Board partnered with the Khan Academy to help people navigate an incredibly complex system associated with SAT and now with the AP course as well. Um, they provide the inside scoop uh, to help people demonstrate their knowledge. Um, we recognize that better takes practice uh, and so we're helping people, everybody, demonstrate how much better they can be. I'm not going to go into details on that because Anju will kill me. Uh, that's her job. Uh, honored to introduce Anju Katan uh, from the Khan Academy. She's been a project manager uh, working on SAT for two years with us. Uh, before that, she worked at McKinsey's business technology office as an engineer with Microsoft. Uh, she earned a computer science degree from University of Michigan, an MBA from Wharton. 
in addition to these impeccable credentials and her amazing passion to help people, um, I've been told that she is capable of giving uh, Madura a run for her title as the queen of Bollywood dancing. So tonight, maybe later at the bar, just saying. Uh, please welcome uh, Anju. Thank you, Bruce, for that lovely introduction and for the volunteering me to apparently perform later on tonight. Um, and thank you all for having me. It is my genuine honor and pleasure to be here with you today. I've been to a couple of the sessions today and have had the opportunity to talk with many of you. And I can say that the genuine passion and care that you all bring to students is truly inspirational. Military children face particularly unique challenges, but it is really through efforts of groups like MSEC and of all of your support, they're able to rise above them and turn these challenges into opportunities. I know I personally have been extremely energized by the conversations that I've had over the past few days. And I hope I can repay a bit of that same favor to you by sharing a little bit about what we're hoping to accomplish at Khan Academy. But before I begin, and as I've been told by, by General Bolden yesterday, videos are a good way to keep the audience entertained. So I'm gonna share a few words from our founder, Sal Khan. Hi, I'm Sal Khan, founder of the Khan Academy, and I'm excited to talk to all of y'all at the Military Child Education Coalition National Training Seminar. For those of y'all who know or, or don't know, Khan Academy is a not-for-profit with a mission of providing a free, world-class education for anyone, anywhere. If you go to Khan Academy, uh, khanacademy.org, you'll see resources, videos, exercises that start in early learning and kindergarten and go all the way to college level calculus and physics and world history. And the goal, the vision, is that any student should be able to go there and fill in their gaps and learn at their own pace. And that any educator, any teacher, any parent should find the tools they need in order to empower students that they care about for them to achieve their learning goals. And there's a lot that we have in common with the Military Child Education Coalition. Our goal is that someone should be able to learn anything, anywhere they are. And we know that a lot of military families need to travel, they're in multiple locations, and so resources like Khan Academy are essential for them. Another really important factor is the importance of humans in all of that. Khan Academy, we make software, we make on-demand video, we make technology, but we don't think technology is an end unto itself. It is a tool, and it's a tool that humans use. And everything that we focus on is how can we use technology to humanize the learning experience. So if students can learn at their own time and pace, can that free up the classroom? Can that free up time in the home for more engagement with a parent, with a teacher, with a counselor? It's a way for students to build confidence, to fill in their gaps, to build in the metacognitive skills of taking ownership over their learning. It's important to know your algebra, your reading, your writing, your history, but just as important is a metacognitive skill of learning how to learn, especially as we go into the 21st century and the world is continuously changing. So you're gonna hear a lot more from my colleague, Anju, uh, about our whole uh, narrative, especially around a lot of the great work we're doing with the College Board around, and the SAT and the, the promising efficacy results, the, the notion that practice really is leading to preparedness for college and life beyond. And I look forward to ongoing conversations and partnerships with all of you. Uh, special thanks and congratulations uh, to Mary Keller and all of you at the Military Child Education Coalition. Thank you. So first, just want to echo what Sal said and say congratulations. It's been such a wonderful couple of days, and this team has done such a, such a phenomenal job. I also want to circle back on something else that Sal said. Khan Academy's mission, a free, world-class education for anyone, anywhere, really does have a lot in common with the work that MSEC is doing and what we've seen at the conference over the past few days. In particular, the anywhere portion really seems to resonate. As we heard today, just now, the statistic is that military-connected children generally move between six to nine times through their K-12 through school years. And again, as we heard from the students, during each of these times, they have to get acclimated to a new environment, make new friends, and generally just fit in. Additionally, they also have to adapt to what is very likely a different curriculum. So let's imagine Susie, 
Susie is a sixth grader in Warren, Michigan. She starts off her school year in her math class learning about ratios. As her teacher teaches the concepts, she's feeling pretty good. Things are starting to make sense, they're gelling. She's generally just cruising along. However, her parents are in service, and about a month and a half into the school year, Susie's family moves to Central California. Now, as Susie walks into her first day of math class in California, she finds that her teacher there actually spent the first month and a half of school teaching his class about two-digit decimal division, and is now planning to spend the, the, the next lesson on ratios. All of a sudden, Susie's at a disadvantage. Not only is she repeating that lesson on ratios, which, you know, in and of itself isn't terrible, it's a reinforcement of concepts, but she's completely missed that lesson on two-digit decimal division. Now, in the next class, when Susie's teacher expects them to go back and forth between ratios and decimals and back again, Susie's lost. She begins to get demoralized and feel like she just doesn't have that math gene. Now, this is a reality for many students. They may have fallen sick on a particular day, they may have taken longer than the one or two weeks allocated to learn a foundational concept. Or, like Susie, they may have traveled across country and moved and gone to a place where things are just taught in a slightly different order. In each of these cases, the Swiss cheese gaps in knowledge are starting to build up. Now, the strange thing is, is that this is actually considered normal in those places. In order for Susie to move on to the next topic, all she needs to do is pass. That's typically about a 60%. So that begs the question, what about that other 40% that Susie may not have understood? Even for an A student, that's like 90%. You know, they may have gotten a couple of careless mistakes here and there, but that's up to 10% that they may not have understood that first time around. When do they get to come back to, to that, that concept and relearn that? There are many things in life that we wouldn't be comfortable doing at a 60 to 90% completion. To truly drive home the absurdity of this, Sal likes to often talk about what if we approach other things in life this way, like, say, building a house. So imagine this. You're really excited. You get the go-ahead to build a house. You call in the contractors, and they come in, and you're like, yes, we're building a house. We're going to start with the foundation, but we're on a time crunch. We only have two weeks. Do what you can. So the contractors do what they can. They get to work. They're moving along. But along the way, somebody falls sick, and they get slightly off schedule. And then two weeks just fly by. At the end of that two weeks, the inspector comes in and looks around and is like, yeah, that part over there, cement's not totally dry. That part over there, it's like mostly complete. All in all, I'd say you're about an 80%. You and the contractors look at each other and like, 80%? Fantastic, that's a B minus. Let's move on to the first floor. First floor, second floor, this goes on. By the time they get to the third floor, all of a sudden, the entire structure collapses around them. Now in education, a typical response to this might be to blame the contractors, or to say the inspector just didn't do a thorough enough job. But really, what's broken here is the process. We actually took the time to identify the gaps, but then we did nothing about them. Traditionally, this has been a really tough problem to solve. In order for, for students to really go at their own pace, and, and access material at the pace that it's comfortable for them. A teacher would have to create individual assignments for each of the students. They'd have to group the class into smaller, different sections and teach multiple lessons in a pretty limited time frame. This just couldn't scale. However, tools exist today to help. If a student is stuck on a particular concept, they can access an on-demand video. If they want practice that's calibrated to their own level, they can go get automated exercises with step-by-step -step instructions along the way. And all of this frees up time for the educators and the teachers in the classroom to really facilitate meaningful dialogue and encourage creative exploration of the topics. And perhaps even more importantly, students are taught to learn how to learn. They're instilled this growth mindset concept that we've heard a couple of times throughout this conference. They're taught that if I don't understand something the first time, it doesn't mean that I'm never going to get it. It just means that I haven't understood it yet. And this notion of building mastery through practice has been at the core of Khan Academy's DNA since the beginning. So, show of hands, who here has heard of Khan Academy from before today? That's good, that's a lot of you. All right, who here has used Khan Academy? Slightly less. All right, well, I'll talk a little bit more about what Khan Academy actually is and how we help students like Susie build mastery. 
But to answer this, I'm going to take us back on a bit of a historical journey to 2004, when Sal, our founder, was working in finance in Boston. He got a call from his cousin Nadia asking him, being like, Sal, I'm really struggling in math. They're about to put me in remedial classes. Please help. And Sal's kind of a tiger cousin, so being the nice guy that he is, he's like, sure, I'll help you. And he began to tutor Nadia remotely. Nadia went pretty quickly from being in, in remedial classes to actually going into honors. And word got around among Sal's cousin that there was free tutoring happening in the family. And so he got all of these calls to, to actually help tutor his family and just ran out of time. And so as he did this, he started putting up videos on YouTube. So Sal's in his closet putting up videos on YouTube, and he started to hear a couple of things. First, his cousins came to him and were like, Sal, we kind of like YouTube you better than real life you. <laughs> so after Sal got over being offended, he stepped back and was like, yeah, I think this actually kind of makes sense. You know, first, if his cousins, could, if his cousins were stuck, they could pause or rewind YouTube Sal. Trust me, that's a lot harder to do with real life Sal. Second, they didn't have this constant pressure of somebody, albeit very well-meaning, standing over their shoulder asking, does that make sense? Did you get it yet? They could really go at their own pace and be comfortable in what they were learning, and then go back to Sal afterwards and ask him the questions. The other thing that started happening was that students who were not his cousins, I think most famously Bill Gates's kids, actually started accessing these videos. So what I'm saying is that in addition to, to videos of cats playing pianos and such, math videos went viral on YouTube. If that doesn't speak to an unmet need, I'm not sure what does. So Sal started seeing his view count go up, and he started getting positive comments from internet strangers, things like, I finally get this, or I'm excited to take calculus, or most commonly, just thank you. Now, those of you who are familiar with YouTube know that thank you is probably not the most common comment that you get on YouTube, but he started seeing this, and with this coming in, he realized that he was actually onto something that could be truly groundbreaking for students. And so in 2009, he left his job at Khan Academy and started Khan Academy full, or he left his job in banking and started Khan Academy full time. Now, Khan Academy has traditionally been known for its YouTube videos on math, but even from the early days, even the earliest version of our website, we had this notion of video lessons along with practice sets. Sal really believed in this idea of building mastery through practice. And that notion has actually grown across grades, subjects, and geographies. And Khan Academy is now translated into over 10 languages. We're in over 190 countries, so students like Susie, who are transferred from place to place, can access the same curriculum no matter where they're at. Over 1.9 million educators have registered on Khan Academy, and over 50 million students have registered. Collectively, they've done over 8 billion problems. These numbers never fail to blow my mind. In addition to math, we also offer instruction in physics, chemistry, history, biology, grammar, computer science, SAT, and that list keeps growing. In most of these subjects, students can access not only the video lessons, but also articles or practice that with, complete with hints and rationales to really help guide them along the way. A student can come onto Khan Academy to learn an entire subject, like say, Algebra 1, and go through it topic by topic really making sure that every single concept along the way is, is accounted for, that they really don't have any gaps in their foundations. And of course, we'll celebrate their progress with them along the way. Alternatively, a student can come to Khan Academy at 10 p.m. the night before a really hard chemistry exam, not understanding atomic mass at all. And they can pull out their mobile phone, mobile device, pull out the Khan Academy app, and find just the right practice set or video lesson to really help them get to their aha moment. And of course, they couldn't do, do this without the support of, of other educators and adults in their lives. And so we also offer resources for teachers to, to come and support their students along the way. Just last week, I think last Monday in fact, we launched a fully redesigned version of our coach resources, making it easier than ever for coaches to not only access the data on their students, but also then to do something about it. And so far, we've actually had pretty fantastic results. In a study done a couple years ago, 
It was found that students who did about 60% of their grade level on our missions product, this is our personalized learning math product, grew 1.8 times their expected growth within a given year. In another study, students across top universities in the US were surveyed. And it was found that 64% of first generation students, these are students whose parents didn't have the opportunity to go to college before them, said that Khan Academy had a meaningful impact on their education. And for me, the thing that keeps me coming to work every single day, the thing that keeps me excited are the student stories. So from Josie, Khan Academy, you are my lifesaver. Not only am I able to better understand what I'm studying at university, I'm a biochemistry major, but you spark my interest and my passion for biology and chemistry. I perform better and I feel more confident in my learning. Or like Andy, I took my first physics class at age 24 in college. Due to military service, I had a six year gap between high school and this class. I stumbled across Khan Academy while desperately searching for help. After a few videos and some practice problems, the seemingly confusing problems became much clearer. Without the help provided, I doubt I could have completed the class with a good grade and a solid understanding of the concepts. Like I said, I think I'm the luckiest person in the world to get to hear stories like this every day. And we get reinforced this at our company updates every Monday as well. It's, it's a pretty great feeling. So with that as setting the stage for Khan Academy more broadly, I now want to take some time to dive a bit more deeply into a key focus area of ours over the past few years and what I personally spend my own time on. Helping to level the playing field and build college readiness for all students, regardless of their background or, opportunity to, or access to opportunity through free and official SAT practice. So 2014 or so, David Coleman, the CEO of the College Board and who I believe had the pleasure of speaking to you all last year, had this vision. He had this idea that the SAT should really and truly test the concepts that students needed to be successful in college and in their career. He had this notion that practicing for the SAT and building the skills needed to be successful beyond high school were truly one and the same. And he also wanted to ensure that it wasn't just those students who, had, who could afford expensive classes that, that could benefit from this deep practice and this deep learning. And so he approached Sal and asked, you know, would, would Khan Academy be interested in helping us realize this vision? We were immediately intrigued. At Khan Academy, we've always been about helping to unblock students from achieving their, their dreams. And we'd recently just started adding college readiness content to our website. So this just felt like a natural fit. And in 2014, Sal and David went, took a, well, made a public commitment to the world to provide free and official SAT practice to all students in time for the first new SAT. That gave us a year. In software terms, that's not a long time. <laughs> so we gathered this group of engineers, data scientists, designers, educators, and even students to really truly help create the world's best test prep that just happens to be free. This group of people put together a product with thousands and thousands of practice problems, complete with video lessons and step-by-step -step explanations along the way. And on June 2nd, 2015, we launched official SAT practice and haven't looked back. Today, a student can come onto the site and access a custom tailored practice plan that takes them from today all the way through test day. They can either start by taking a diagnostic or by connecting their college board and Khan Academy accounts. In doing so, we'll actually slurp in the results of their past PSAT or their SATs and use the actual answers on the exam to really create a custom tailored practice plan for them that, that helps them work on their weaknesses and reinforce their strengths. As the students practice, the system continues to adapt along with them, adding in timed practice and full exams because we want the students to not only be comfortable with the concepts going into the day of the exam, we want them to be prepared and know what to expect when they walk in the door. We want them to be like, yeah, I got this. I've practiced. I really put in my time. I know where my strengths are. Now it's go time. And so far, we've been thrilled with the results that we've seen and how students have responded to this call to practice. Four million students have logged on to the product since launch on June 2nd, 2015. Over 40 percent of all SAT test takers have said that they've used college, uh, they said they used Khan Academy to practice. For context, that's nearly double the number of students who used all other commercial test prep combined. And going back to that notion of leveling the playing field, usage has actually been equal regardless of student background. 
Now, usage stats are always great, but what we really want to know is are we helping students? Are we making an impact? And so we looked at about a quarter million students uh, who connected their PSA, who connected their College Board and Khan Academy accounts and took both the new PSAT and the SAT, about a quarter million students, and found that 20 hours of practice on Khan Academy was associated with an average of 115 point score gain between the PSAT and the SAT. That's nearly double the average score gain of students who did not use official SAT practice. And it wasn't just the students who were practicing 20 or more hours who saw these types of gains. Students who practiced six to eight hours on Khan Academy also saw something like 90 points of an average score gain between their PSAT and their SAT. And again, going back to leveling the playing field, these gains actually held regardless of background. So in other words, say it again, 20 hours of practice on Khan Academy was associated with a 115 point score gain regardless of gender, race, family income, and parental education. These are more than just numbers. They represent real opportunities. They represent possible colleges and universities that have been unlocked that were previously out of reach. And perhaps even scholarships that may have made college itself previously out of reach. We've heard from students like Valencia who dream big and want to go play at Division I schools, but maybe not have got, maybe aren't quite there yet with their SAT scores or with their academics, and spent the time on Khan Academy and spent the time practicing and really furthering their own dreams here and seeing the results, as, uh, seeing the results from it. But we know this is just the beginning. As I mentioned, just last week, we launched a fully redesigned version of our coach resources. In conjunction with that, for the first time ever, we're enabling teachers to also follow along with their students' SAT practice. So this means if a student you know, is struggling with the units or something like that, a teacher can not only see that pretty quickly, they can actually access resources like lessons plan lesson plans created by fellow teachers or related content on Khan Academy they can assign to their students immediately to help ensure that there are no gaps in their knowledge. So I urge you, please, let students know that these resources exist. Let them know that they're all free and they always will be free and there for them. Let them know that there are caring adults out there who are invested in their future and who want to see them achieve their dreams. After all, we kind of want every student to walk into the SAT looking a little something like this. Nothing builds it like practice. And now, the best way to get ready for the SAT is free for everyone. Get a plan built just for you at satpractice.org. So how many of you look like that going into your SATs? I know I look nothing like that. So we've talked a little bit about Khan Academy's philosophy where we started from and where we are today. I now want to end with painting a picture of what the future could look like. So last year, Sal laid out a 10-year vision for, for Khan Academy, and I'd like to read you an excerpt. In 10 years, Khan Academy will enable every core subject to be learned by any student anywhere, all for free. This means a young girl in the slum of Mumbai who only has access to her family's low-cost smartphone will be able to self-educate from Khan Academy. This means that in 10 years, a middle-class student in the suburbs of Atlanta can interact with Khan Academy daily to get help, do homework, develop passions, and learn at their own pace. This really is a two-part vision. First, we want to help supercharge the classrooms. We want to help teachers everywhere really ensure that Swiss cheese gaps are a thing of the past, and that students like Susie, who have to deal with these multiple transitions, can do so seamlessly and with the support that they have available to them. Additionally, we want to help teachers really convey the beauty and the intuition in a subject and help students see that these aren't just facts to remember. These are real things, real concepts that apply to their daily lives. 
Secondly, we want to ensure that students, regardless of their background or their access to opportunity, can not only develop deep skills and learn rigorous things on Khan Academy, but they also have that mean something. We want to be able to, to take the, the young girl in the slum of Mumbai who really spent that time learning, to be able to go to her future colleges and employers and have them recognize the effort, the grit, and the knowledge that she's attained. If this feels like science fiction to you, you're not alone. These are wildly ambitious goals. However, most of what I've talked about today felt like science fiction to Sal sitting in his closet 10 years ago. Imagine this. 12 years ago, YouTube didn't exist. Today, along with cat videos of cats playing pianos, students can access a full curriculum on their pocket computer, and they do so daily without thinking about it. Science fiction can come true. And there's no more important mission than this one, than helping students today become the leaders of tomorrow. And I truly believe that with groups like MSAC working together with Khan Academy and others, that in 10 years time, we can turn science fiction into science fact. We can help make sure that students like Susie are truly up to code in their knowledge from foundation to roof. So I wanna leave you with one final video from Diana, a really special ROTC student at Oak Ridge High School in Florida, who embodies these concepts of mastery, of practice, and of taking ownership of her own future. I used to stutter a lot. I couldn't speak to someone. I couldn't look at them in their eyes. Like, everything was just intimidating to me. I used to be a totally different person before I got into the program. Look at me now. I'm the group commander. I'm number one. I'm in charge. To the rear. Hard. I really want to be a lawyer inside the military, and I have to do a lot of things to get there. And that's what I love about it, because it pushed me to study, just like ROTC pushed me. I'm a very determined person. I, I won't stop until I get what I want. So practice, 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 and practice for my SAT. If I have to study more, if I have to stay up, I will do it to get there. You know, there's a reward at the end, but I'm not working for the reward. You know, I'm working for something bigger. I'm gonna keep going because this is what I wanna do. This is my goal and I wanna accomplish it. Thank you, and as we say at Khan Academy, onward. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the stage, Earl Sims and Mr. Jack Ballantyne.